Hi, and welcome to On the Economy, a video version. Uh, today, I, it's my pleasure to interview uh, a former colleague and a good friend, Ross Eisenbray, who's the vice president at the Economic Policy Institute. Uh, folks may recall that a, a few weeks ago, there was a, a right to work legislation, uh, so-called, passed in uh, Michigan. Uh, Ross wrote, I thought, very critically and insightfully about uh, this legislation. And I didn't want to let uh, the opportunity to talk to him about it uh, uh, go by, even though the vote was already a few weeks ago. Um, as readers of On the Economy uh, know, uh, of my blog know, um, I focus a lot on problems with economic growth reaching people in the middle class, lower income people, basically the, the gap between economic growth and the prosperity of, of most working families. And one reason for that gap is a lack of bargaining power among uh, many of the folks uh, we're talking about. And one reason for the lack of bargaining power has to do with diminished union power. So I, I'd like to work those kinds of uh, uh, insights, if they're relevant, into the conversation. But let's start with basically, what is it we're talking about when we're talking about uh, this, this so-called right to work law? Okay, well, I, I like to call it the right to work for less law and, and you know, not let them use their own terminology. It's a loaded it, phrase. It's a loaded phrase. It, it, because it has nothing really to do with the right to work, uh, except that uh, unions sometimes bargain uh, a, a contract provision with employers that says uh, everyone has to pay dues to support the union which has negotiated this collective bargaining agreement and enforces it with the employer to make sure people are paid wages and benefits. And if people don't pay their dues, they can't work here. They have, to, they have to pay their fair share. It's not about joining the union. It's about paying their fair share to support. Do they the have to join the union? Bargain. They don't have to join the okay, union. Okay, so that they, 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 they have to pay, uh, make a contribution. They have to pay dues. Right. But they don't have to join the union. And it's actually an agency fee. It doesn't even have to be full dues because if they, for example, don't like that the UAW is supporting Democrats, they can uh, have the part of the union dues that would go toward political causes uh, deduct it. I see. Why have such a rule as the one you're describing? Uh, well, businesses put this into place uh, when Republicans controlled the Congress in 1947. They changed the National Labor Relations Act to allow states to enact these, and, the, and they did it because they thought unions were too strong, mm -hmm. and they wanted something that would uh, make unions spend their time having to chase after their dues payers rather than uh, organize, bargain, go on strike, you know, build up strike funds and do the things that unions might otherwise do. So that's why, um, that's why businesses and conservatives have promoted right to work. Why have unions promoted what, what I, I think is correctly called a closed shop, the thing you were describing before? If you're going to work there, you either have to join the union or at least have to pay dues. Well, it's just like, you know, how do you support your government? You pay taxes. Uh, you don't let people uh, choose whether they want to pay taxes or not. A lot of people would choose not to pay their taxes. So uh, it, it costs a certain amount of money to uh, run the, the union and uh, enforce the contract with the employer. Everyone has to pay their fair share. Uh, I, I've also heard it described that, you know, if, if you're working in a place like that and you're benefiting from union negotiations, which... Uh, by dint of uh, the union premium, meaning you know, union workers have a considerable premium both in wages and in, in, in benefits. If you're not contributing, you're a free rider. So that's right. It would also be the case that um, uh, you know, having the closed shop uh, 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 pushes back against this free rider problem. Um, you at EPI have done some very influential analysis on what happens to states when they invoke right to work laws. I mean, I think we now have 23 states, uh, including Michigan, with, with right to work laws. And you can compare outcomes there. What happens on two dimensions? The kind of things you associate with unions, worker pay, compensation. But in, in a way, more or at least equally importantly to, to, the, you know, to, the, to the view of the, the kind of inequality problem I was describing earlier, what happens to union density, just union membership in those states? Uh, well, it's a, it's a fact that union density is higher in states that don't have these uh, right to work for less laws. Uh, and the states that you traditionally associate with right to work for less are, you know, the Deep South, Mississippi, Alabama, South Carolina, North Carolina, you know, where union density is down to 3, 4 percent. Uh, 
you know, and private sector probably. You're talking. No, I mean overall. Wow. I'm, the uh, I mean in the private sector nationally, we're only at seven percent. So union density public is, sector about thirty five is is uh, over thirty yeah. percent, and so and it balances out to about twelve percent okay. uh, overall, overall yeah. nationwide. But in a state like North Carolina, South Carolina, it's less than three. Okay, so point one. If the purpose of these right-to-work laws among the uh, conservative forces who are behind them is to reduce union membership, it sounds like that's a success. Yeah, okay. it, it's effective. And then the other thing that it's done, and we've done regression analyses at, at EPI, my colleagues, uh, Heidi Scherholz and Elise Gould did this. They, they uh, found that the one thing, well, there are two things that you could say definitively about the economic impact of right-to-work laws. They lower... Uh, wages by fifteen hundred dollars uh, per worker on average, and they make it's it an annual figure, right? An annual figure, mm -hmm. fifteen hundred dollars a year on average, and they make it much less likely, substantially less likely, that employees will have a pension, an employer-provided pension, or health benefits. A lot of us were scratching our heads as to how did this happen in Michigan, and I think either you're from Michigan or you've spent a lot of time there. I am from Michigan. So. What happened? Okay, <laughs> so this was not um, this was not something that was a bubble up from uh, the people kind of movement. Uh, the uh, some very very wealthy right wing uh, businessmen, um, one guy in particular, Richard DeVos, uh, funded this effort. They they decided we have a, a Republican legislature, um, House and Senate. It's going to be less Republican in 2013. Um, even though the governor was, was lukewarm about this, they, they uh, pushed hard. They, they spent 20, I don't know, 22, 23 million dollars reportedly on this campaign, and they twisted the arms of Republicans, including people like the Speaker of the House, who were, um, were not that interested in doing it, and, and, and said, get this thing passed or we will run candidates against you. Hmm. And, and they did, and they, they jammed it through. and. Uh, you know, it's is going it, to be very hard to. Uh, that's what to I'm going to ask you. Is it, it possible that next year's legislature could could overturn this, or it's uh, it's possible, but very <laughs> unlikely. I think it would take a uh, a ballot proposal of some kind, you know, a statewide referendum to do it. Should we expect union density, union membership in Michigan to start falling? Uh, I think over time you would expect if this weren't reversed, it would start to fall. Uh, the biggest unions in the state have contracts that won't be affected uh, until they expire. You know, a current contract is not a, not affected, and the UAW contracts, I think, go for another couple of years. Uh, final question here. Um, I was reading a very interesting uh, article in, in the Libertarian uh, uh, press, uh, which we often think of as kind of a conservative, you know, movement for sure, but really kind of concerned about this right-to-work law because it seemed like it was prohibiting a voluntary contract between employers and workers. Could you comment on that view? Well, I agree with that view, and I, I, I've actually written that too, that, that what you have is a, uh, a contract between workers. They're democratically uh, elected representative. Um, they've, a majority of them have chosen a representative. A union rep. A union rep who has bargained a contract that those workers want and that they won't have unless they ratify it. So it's a democratic process. And with the uh, employer, they've reached an agreement, you know, open voluntary agreement uh, that includes paying your dues to support the organization. There's no requirement for employers and unions to make that agreement, is there? No. I mean, so, so, so the right to work law actually prohibits a voluntary contract. That's right. I, I mean, that's, that's right. pretty that's simple. Right. Wow. So, you know, this thing is pretty circular when you, when you get into it. Lots of uh, right-to-work supporters that I've debated make all kinds of claims about how once a state goes right-to-work, wonderful economic things happen there. Um, what have you found in, in looking into that question? Well, we did, as I mentioned earlier, we've done regression analyses, and none of them uh, supports that notion. But there is an association, and, and we can all sort of feel it, that some of the fastest-growing states uh, are right-to-work states. You know, states like Texas have... They've had tremendous employment growth, and uh, but it but there is no actual uh, uh, cause and effect relationship between right to work 
and, and growth. And the other issue is that, that if you start from a low enough base, uh, then you, you can have growth and, and at the end of the day you, you can end up saying, well, so what? Would you rather live in Maryland, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New Jersey, states where the uh, median house, median family income for a family of four is over a hundred thousand dollars or in faster growing states where the median family income for a family so, of four is much less. Let me put it to you this way. Suppose you were an employer looking for the cheapest place to locate. Just China. cheap, cheap yeah, right. The cheapest place within our borders, you know, to locate. That you might be drawn to a, a right to work state. Suppose you were a person <laughs> looking for the place to locate where you had the best shot at a better standard of living. You probably wouldn't locate in a right to work state. Does that sound like a, a good summary of your research? That that is uh, <laughs> exactly the point I was trying to make. That that uh, you know, I, if if you wanted uh, uh, the best quality of life, would you choose Connecticut or Mississippi? You know, that's sort of what, what, what it boils down to. Uh, well, thank you very much, uh, Ross Eisenbray, uh, Vice President of the Economic Policy Institute, and we'll see you back here soon at On the Economy.